The topic today is Moses, the great prince of the land of Egypt. On the screen, we will see some of the power and the glory of the nation that was his home. We will see pictures of the mummy of the great lady, Pharaoh Hatshepsut. Uh, she was possibly, Hatshepsut, the most powerful woman of the ancient world. I believe that the evidence shows that she was the foster mother of Moses. Today, his life story in the courts of Pharaoh, his call at the burning bush to deliver a nation of slaves, his trials and triumphs, and finally his resurrection and uh, transportation to heaven. Would you please open your Bible? Come over here with me to Luke chapter 16 and verse 31. Luke chapter 16 and verse 31. Luke 16, 31. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Moses is so important in the scriptures. And this is a text in the New Testament, obviously. That if you don't listen to Moses, you won't be convinced even if a person should rise from the dead. It shows you how great this man was, I might say is. Come over here to Deuteronomy 34 and verses, let me see, verses 10 down to 12. Deuteronomy 34, 10 and onwards. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those miraculous signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. I believe the evidence will show that Moses is the greatest character of the Old Testament. Today, we will notice the great prince, the great statesman, the great lawgiver, the great soldier, the great poet, the great writer, the great leader. He was great because God made him great. His greatness was not in himself or because he could have been the Pharaoh. He was great because he was the servant of a great God. It is not an exaggeration to say that Moses, by the grace of God, changed the course of history for a thousand years. Some would say for thousands of years. What can we learn from his life? Now today I've divided his life up into various segments. And the first segment is entitled 40 Years in Egypt. Would you please come now to the book of Exodus chapter 2 and verses 1 down to 10. I want you to turn to these texts and please I want you to turn as quickly as you can. Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 down to 10. We're going to stay for a while in the book of Exodus. Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months because Pharaoh had said all the baby boys of the Hebrews were to be put to death. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the river bank. 
She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it, saw the baby. He was crying. She felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Uh, the River Nile, as some of you would know, was recognized or believed to be a god. And so when he was drawn out of the water or born of the River Nile, they believed that there was something sacred about this. Egypt, of course, is the land of the River Nile. It is the River Nile that makes Egypt the marvelous and the wonderful place it is. A few hundred miles from north to south, just a few miles across because of the burning sands of the desert. But the little area of land which has been flooded by the Nile River for thousands and thousands of years, this little bit of dirt produced the greatest kings and queens in the history of the world. It is interesting to note that the first five books of the Bible were written by a man who was born in the land of Egypt. If you come down the river a few hundred miles, as I have more occasions than I can remember, you come to Luxor, where you have the greatest sun temple on the face of the earth. Some would say the greatest worship center in the history of the world. That is down here a few hundred miles south of Cairo. This area up here by its very shape was called by the Greeks the Delta. Over here you have the great pyramids of the Giza Plateau. But what is of interest to a person who loves the Bible is that right here in the Delta, they have discovered the city of Ramesses. Now this is somewhat a recent discovery. But the city of Ramesses is of some significance in our story because the Bible tells me when the children of Israel left the land of Egypt, they left from the city of Ramses. I want you to know this. For 40 years, he was in Egypt. For at least 28 years, he was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I believe if you compare the biblical chronologies with the Bible chronologies, then it seems almost clear that the foster mother of Moses was the woman Hatshepsut. And today we will probably show you some pictures of Hatshepsut. A few years ago when I spoke on this subject, I told the people the body of Hatshepsut was destroyed by her son-in-law. I was wrong. But the next best thing was done. Her body was lost, only just discovered by Dr. Hawass, whom I interviewed just recently in the Cairo Museum. And today we can gaze upon the face of the woman who most likely was the princess who went down and saw the little papyrus basket and her heart was moved as the baby cried. I want you folks to know something. It seems evident from a study of the scriptures, and this is almost overwhelming, that Moses, who wrote the first five books 
of the Bible could have been the Pharaoh. He was being trained to be the Pharaoh. Now, those of you here and those of you who are watching on televised who are mesmerized by money and gold, remember this. This is just little stuff that you're mesmerized by. Moses could have had all the wealth and all the gold and all the glory that Egypt could give him. But a turning point came in his life. And if you read there, Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 and onwards. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, glancing this way and that and seeing no one. He killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Sometimes God's got to give us a shove before we do his will. Maybe if this had not happened, Moses today would be in the Cairo Museum. But when he saw his people being roughed up and beaten, Something stirred in his heart and he said, I don't belong with these people, the Egyptians and the pharaohs. I belong with these despised people of God. And this was the turning point in his life when God gave him a shove. I want you to come over here to Hebrews chapter 11. Keep your finger there in the book of Exodus and come over here to the New Testament to the book of Hebrews 11 and verse 24 to 26, my dear friends. Hebrews 11, 24 to 26, the Bible says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. So, 40 years in the palace, wealthy, rich, in every possible way that you can imagine. You notice on the screen... These are somewhat more recent discoveries. Had the privilege of going into that tomb. And there you can actually see Semites, like the Hebrews. Maybe they were. Maybe they were the people who lived in the days of Moses. But here is evidence that Semites from Asia and Palestine were slaves in the land of Egypt. So the people are getting beaten up and there's a stirring in his heart. I'm in the wrong place. I ought to be with the people of God. So he runs away and he goes to a little place and there God gives him a wife. Look at Exodus 2, verse 16 and onwards. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, perfect number, And they came to draw water and to fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away. But Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? They answered, An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he, this Egyptian? Where is he? 
He asked his daughters, why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become an alien in a foreign land. Listen to this. If you're looking for a wife or if you're looking for a husband, God has the right person for you. But don't rush ahead of God. Let God get you the right person. Or else you'll regret it. But God chose for Moses, this is interesting, a woman of another race. Even though she was a descendant of Abraham. And so now Moses is married. And, uh, and uh, the suffering in Egypt went on. Would you please notice a text? I want you to see this text, please. I want you to come to Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. During that long period, you know how long that was? He was in this wilderness looking after sheep 40 years. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and remembered the covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. This is a mystery to me. Moses is a shepherd, 40 years a prince. Could have been the Pharaoh. He goes up here to Midian and he gets a wife. And he's there for 40 years. And the Bible says in a few sentences, and the suffering went on. Another 40 years. Another 40 years of pain. It seems to me, my beloved friend, that God has a plan and God won't be rushed. I'm impatient. I stand in front of a microwave when I put my uh, uh, oatmeal in. Roll oats, they call it in Australia. When I put my oatmeal in and it takes two minutes and I stand in front of the microwave and I do this. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, can't you go... Somebody said you can get some oatmeal that you can cook in a minute. I will get it when I find it. Come on. <laughs> but God said, you got to be patient. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Now, you see, we want things instant. Instant potato. In America, the fast foods. But God is not a person into fast foods. God works on the 40-year plan. The 40-year plan. And Romans 8, verse 28, you ought to know it off by heart. The Bible says, and in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Amen. So God's got a plan, but his plan is not a plan without suffering and pain and heartache. And God, my friend, Listen to this. Doesn't seem to be in a hurry. Look at Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Listen to this. You saw King Tut. Now, King Tut came about 100 years or so after Moses. You saw King Tut with all his glory. Moses, once upon a time, walked around, strutted around Egypt with that stuff, wearing that. He's wealthy. He's got more money than you can poke a stick at. But God said to him, that doesn't count. How much money you 
gut, my friend, doesn't count with God. And the text says one verse, one verse squeezes in 40 years. There he's a shepherd. 40 years looking after sheep. You know why God made him a shepherd? Because soon he was going to be looking after a a different kind of sheep and not so agreeable. Back in Australia, in New South Wales, right on the southern part as it goes into Victoria, I got to know Greg and Loris Eames. They had sheep. I was a boy who was brought up in the city, but I've spent now a lot of time with sheep here and in Australia. (laughs) You know what about sheep? Wait till you hear this. If a farmer puts sheep in the back of a utility or a pickup and he pushes the sheep out because he wants them to go to another part of the field, if a sheep falls on its back, you know what the sheep will do? Stay there. God calls his people sheep. Goats won't do that. If there's a fire in the stubble, the goats will run away and get out of the fire. The sheep will stay and get burned. They'll stay and get burned to a cinder. And so God says, I've got a job for you. The man who could have been Pharaoh. And he says, you need to learn some patience. Like I need to learn it. I need to learn patience. Moses needed a lot of patience. Forty years. And during that time, he forgot about Egypt. And he forgot about the royal throne. And he settled down looking after dumb sheep. Now the next segment, the burning bush and his return to Egypt. Look at Exodus chapter 3, 1 to 10. Now Moses was tending the flock. Verse 2, Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why, the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he'd gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about all their suffering. Then if you come down to verse 14, Moses said, what is your name? Because God said, I want you to go and talk to the Israelites. Moses said, what is your name? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. This is the name that we should say with reverence and with fear. This is the name of the almighty God. In scripture, he is called Yahweh Elohim. And when Jesus came to this earth and he was uh, having a confrontation with the Pharisees, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And so the person who came down to this world, who became incarnate, 
who one day was to take the cross upon his broad shoulders. This was the person who's now talking to Moses. Have you had an experience like that? I was telling the people on Wednesday night, it's quoting Jim Gilly's book. Religion, we don't want religion. It's too much religion. Most of us are too religious. What we want is Christ. Amen. We want genuine Christianity. So Moses meets God. I think this was the first time Moses had really met God. There must come a time in every man's life, every woman's life, if he's going to be saved, when he's going to meet God. Every person must have his own burning bush experience. Moses was not getting religion. Moses was meeting Christ. Look at chapter 4, verse 20. God says, I got a job for you to do, and you got to go back. I don't want to go back. Well, I want you to go back. No, I don't want to go back. Chapter 4 and verse 20. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, started back to Egypt. That's the place where I don't want to go because they were going to kill me. They were going to put me in prison. Started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. Verse 29, Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and they worshiped. After not 40 years, after 80 years, there is light at last because God is going to do something. But God is not in the fast food business. And the Bible tells us things got worse. <laughs> when Moses went back, things got worse. Remember this, things often get worse before they get better. I want you to look at Exodus chapter 5 and verse 1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh, taught Moses, and said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Let my people go, let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. And uh, if you read the text at your own convenience, Pharaoh, and we believe I believe from the evidence he was talking to Pharaoh, Tutmoses the third. And I've gazed upon his face in the Cairo Museum where Moses could have been. And Pharaoh said, I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And then he said, if you want trouble, you've come to the right place. He said, Double their workload. Don't supply them with straw. Make it hard. Grind them down into the dust. So things got worse. But after a time of intense hardship and persecution and confrontation, there you have him, Tutmosis the third. The stepbrother, I believe, of Moses. But God said, enough is enough. Look at Exodus chapter 6 and verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of the country. Uh, I wish I could have been there for those confrontations. When there was Pharaoh sitting with all his glory, with his golden crown, and um, 
surrounded by his wives and his princes, and he was a man from the desert, standing with the staff of God. He had no tanks and he had no guns, but he had the word of God. And he said, the word of God says, let my people go. And that Moses says, never. One wise man said this, man may have his hour, but God will have his day. And in the end, uh, the will of God will happen. Whatever man tries to do, the will of God will be accomplished even though it takes 80 years. And even though things get worse before they get better, these are lessons you can learn. God visited Egypt. We don't have time to show them to you. Visited Egypt with 10 plagues of judgment. Some people who don't know the Bible say God never punishes. I've had them say to me, God never punishes. God will never destroy the wicked. The wicked will destroy themselves because God never punishes. Explain the 10 plagues. Blood, gnats, frogs, flies everywhere. The curse on the livestock, boils, hail, the fire that ran along the ground, the locust, the supernatural darkness, and then the angel of death, the Passover. I've stood in the place, the temple of Tutmosis the third, where he could have well had, he could well have received the message about putting the blood on the door. But of course, he would not believe in the gospel of Christ and putting the blood on the door. You know the story, the angel of death passed over and if you had the blood on the door, you were safe. But if you didn't have the blood on the door, your firstborn was a dead soul. There's only one thing, my friend, that can save a soul and that is the blood on the door. I ask you today, do you have the blood on the door or are you trusting in your own righteousness and your own religion? There was the blood on the door. And that night a wail went up from Tut Moses, who'd lost his son and all the courtiers and all the women were grieving and even the cattle. The firstborn died. Then the Pharaoh got up in the night and he cried out and he said to Moses, he told Moses, never see me again because the day you see me again, I'll kill you. But he summons Moses and he said, go, take your wives, take your children, take your livestock, go. And that is called the Exodus. And they left from the city of Ramesses. What a story this is. I've stood in the place the Bible actually mentions the city. The city of Ramesses in the delta. Exodus chapter 12 it is. Verse 37. This is a city that was lost for thousands and thousands of years. In fact, they confused it with another city by the name of Tanis. All the archaeologists thought that Ramesses was Tanis, but they were wrong. And this bit of earth today that I visited recently with the television crew is the site that once was one of the greatest cities of the ancient world. Nothing there today. It was this city that saw the birth of freedom because from this city, the children of Israel went forth to cross the Red Sea. Look at the text. Exodus 12, 37. The Israelites journeyed from Ramses to Sakoth. There were about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. Let me tell you the story. Because we won't have time to read all the texts. As they journeyed out of the old city of Ramses, 
which was even greater than the ancient city of Babylon. Nothing there today. I stood there and I thought of the wonder of it all. And as they journeyed, they came to the Red Sea, the Hebrew says, the Reed Sea. Whatever it is, it makes no difference to me. But the Egyptians decided they were not going to let them go. And the Egyptians came out with their chariots. And the children of Israel went to water and started to cry and complain. And God in his infinite mercy came. God in his infinite mercy came with a great cloud of fire. And the cloud of fire came between the Israelites and the pursuing Egyptians. And while they were crying and moaning and doubting the power of God, which is something we all seem to do, God told Moses to do something. Exodus 14, 13. God answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Look at me. We all have Red Sea experiences. If you're doing anything that's worthwhile, you'll have a Red Sea experience where the enemy is behind you and the people of God are complaining. And in front of you, there is nothing but a watery grave. On that occasion, my friend, uh, we must not murmur. We must walk forward in faith and get our feet wet. I remember when we were running the campaign in the city of Kiev. We were told, close down the meeting. The government told us that. Close down the meetings. Stop the meetings. Or else they said to me, we will not guarantee your safety. By the grace of God, we decided we would go ahead even at the risk of our lives. And God delivered us and protected us and saved us and we saw the greatest baptism of three and a half thousand souls Amen. because we said humbly we went forward in faith. Some of you are going through hard times financially. Now is the time not to complain. Now is the time have faith in God. Amen. And walk out. Walk out on the water. It's time to look to the God of Israel. It is time to have faith. It is time to move forward. And here we see the leader. The leader never leads from an armchair. Moses the leader, the man of God, the man who spoke to God, the man who spoke for God, whom the Lord knew face to face. Moses the man of faith, the man of courage, the man of action. Listen. Words don't cut it. Religious palaver doesn't cut it. Pious platitudes don't cut it in a crisis. God wants his man or his woman not to talk but to do. Amen. Obedience. And Moses was a man of obedience but an imperfect man. He led the children of Israel through the Red Sea. I have been in the tomb of Tutmosis III, whom I believe was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. I took a television crew in there, and one of the most amazing things is this, that the tomb was finished in a hurry. You can see how it was rushed. It was never completed which is what one would expect if this man died prematurely. So they got through the Red Sea 
And now we come to Moses and the mountain. God came down with fire and thunder and gave the Ten Commandments. But while Moses was on the mountain, the people got bored and restless. Look at Exodus 32. We'll start at verse 15. We can't read all of this. Moses turned, went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, the holy law of God. They're inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. So this is the law of Almighty God. When Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, there is the sound of war in the camp. Moses replied, it's not the sound of victory. It's not the sound of defeat. It's the sound of singing that I hear. When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and uh, the dancing, those of you who are advocates of dancing, look at the text. He saw the calf and the dancing. His anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf they'd made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to powder, scattered it on the water and made the Israelites drink it. He said to Aaron, what did you do? Aaron, you're my offsider. You're my assistant. God has called you. I was up there getting the command." Aaron said, well, you know what the people are like? The people got upset and they brought me all their jewelry and I threw this into the fire and the calf came out. Hmm. These stories teach us not the sins of the Israelites and the Jews, though they teach that also. They teach us our own sins. As the poet said, How prone we are to leave the God we love. Don't think that the great characters of the Bible were like the people who win the Oscars and the Emmys. Or the people on some of the American television shows that the Americans go crazy over. The great characters of the Bible were not mamby-pambies. Colorless, bloodless wimps. Moses had the capacity to get angry. It's called righteous indignation. There is a need for righteous indignation today. God's people need to be righteously indignant against lying, laziness, blasphemy, cowardice, abuse of human beings by human beings. Did you know today that in the world there are more slaves now than in the days of John Newton and Wilbur Wilberforce? More slaves. So he was a man who could get mad, as we would say, against that which is evil Be careful because most of us just get angry. But he had righteous indignation. Then he went to God and he said, God, I know these people are not worth much, but he said, if you're going to blot anybody out of the book, blot my name out. That's why God loved him so much. He had not only a heart for God, he had the heart of God. And then you've got 40 years Another 40 years in the wilderness. I've been to that wilderness. Oh, the Bible says it's a dreadful place. The Bible is right. It's a land, the Bible says, of scorpions and snakes and hunger and thirst. But that wasn't the problem. Don't have time to tell you. There were the rebellions of the people of God. Korah, Dathan, and Abihu. 250 leaders got together. At one time, they wanted to stone Moses. And really, the climax of his life came, I think, or 
a climax before, the big climax, when the people were complaining that they wanted to go back to Egypt and they were thirsty. God said, Moses, Moses was now 120 years old. He was tired. He was weary. God understood, I think. God said, you see that rock? Strike it once. You know what the rock represented? Jesus. Moses went to the rock. He was tired. He was exasperated. And he took the staff and he struck it and he said, then he struck it again. He said, must we fetch you water out of this rock, you rebels? Think God doesn't care? God said, Moses, I can't take you over the Jordan. He said, oh, let me go. Let me go over the Jordan. See this good land. God said, I can't take you there because you didn't keep faith with me. Then a little bit later, when they're almost at the Jordan, he says, God, I want to have a talk with you. I want to go over. God says, don't talk to me about it again. You know why? Moses kept talking about it. God would have given in. But God says, Moses, I want you to climb the mountain. I've been there. Get the picture. Don't have time to read the text. But he goes up the mountain. This man of God. This man who was a representative of Christ. The Bible says, up on the top of the mountain, he lay down. And the Bible says, he buried him there. You know who buried him? God buried him. He never made it into the promised land. After all the struggles, the serpents, the sheep and the goats, he never made it. Life is full of disappointments. But I want to tell you folks something. God did for Moses something that Moses could have dreamed possible. You know what happened? The Bible tells me, this is in the New Testament, that Jesus came down and resurrected him. And when Jesus was struggling, Moses came back on the Mount of Transfiguration and said, hold on, it's worth it. Moses is home in glory. Tut Moses III, Hatshepsut, Amenhotep, a whole lot of them, I sort of know them pretty well. They're dried out old mummies in the Cairo Museum. Moses is home in glory. And he's home in glory because he made the right choice. The most important thing that you and I can do is to choose Christ and to choose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season.